Welcome to our second of three book clubs for this season. This is our third season of having a book club. And tonight we're featuring a wonderful little book called A Pocket Guide to Pigeon Watching, Getting to Know the World's Most Misunderstood Book, Bird, by Rosemary Mosco. Next slide, please. Or I do it, huh? Do I advance? Okay, well, I'd like to, first of all, I know several of you showed the book and I'd like you to just look at the cover for a minute and notice how uh, Rosemary has put a spotlight on the pigeon on the cover of this book. It's not that bright of a spotlight, but she does this throughout the book to highlight how important pigeons are and that they're the stars. And next to her, there's a little picture of a, a, a pigeon who's playing a game, presumably taught by human beings. And pigeons have been companions for human beings for, for thousands of years. And they provide us with companionship as well as some fun and entertainment and many other things. So Rosemary Mosco is a science communicator, an acclaimed cartoonist, creator of the webcomic Bird and Moon, author of science books for young people, and also a New York Times bestseller, Atlas Obscura Explorer's Guide for the World's Most Adventurous Kid. She was the co-author for that. And I just recently discovered actually today that Rosemary was with the uh, Western Cuyahoga Audubon Society meeting in October of 2020. I must have missed that. Um, I was just getting to be a member then. Um, and so there is a wonderful uh, meeting. It's available on our website and it uh, features Rosemary mostly as a cartoonist and talking about her bird and moon uh, features. And then there's also an interview with Rosemary with Betsy O'Hagan, who was formerly with us. And she has a, a nice 20 minute interview where we get to know a lot more about Rosemary. Well, in the very introduction, Rosemary opens the book with saying, why watch pigeons? And so that very first question, why? Now she gives lots of reasons. She is such an enthusiast for pigeons, pigeon watching. And she uh, made it her studies for a long time. So there are a lot of good reasons. Uh, one of which is that they're pretty easy to find. They're gentle and safe to watch. They have some fascinating things about them, like three eyelids. And did you know that they make milk? Both the male and the female pigeon make milk. And um, if you're also following pigeons, you might be able then to find some other majestic birds of prey around and get a bigger picture of nature. And then the power of genetics. Wow, is there a variety. Um, they have been our companion for millennia and they can teach us a lot about human history, culture, colonialism, inequality, architecture, agriculture, and changing food preferences. And I may ask any of you, when was the last time you had squab? Additionally, watching pigeons is, is free. Now, the, the very first question of the book is another question. And that question is, how do you feel about pigeons? And if anybody would like to answer right now, I'd appreciate a little discussion if you'd like to unmute. Do you pay attention to pigeons? Do you list them on your eBird? How about do you look at them with binoculars? Do you feed them? And are you a potential pigeon enthusiast? Would anybody like to say anything? 
I'll start, Drina. This is oh. Michelle Brocious. Um, so I do pay attention to pigeons even before reading the book and and we'll list them on eber lists um you know we're supposed to list everything we can identify and usually you know those are, are pretty common commonly known birds i do look at them through binoculars i have never fed a pigeon um as far as potential pigeon enthusiast i i think so i um really enjoyed reading about all the different colors that they can come in and you know the, the the dna and everything and i think that i will watch them a little more closely to see if i could see any genetic differences um i am also a, a wildlife photographer so i will be really paying attention when i'm in areas where there's pigeons now and have my camera with me and see if i can capture a, a more rare looking specimen i guess Well, this is Nancy Howell, and we were just having a little discussion prior to the program beginning about the uh, Cooper's Hawk and a pigeon uh, encounter on our Tremont Urban Bird Walk just this past Saturday, and uh, I think the pigeon lost. Mm. Mm. But the but the I think one of the hawks because there was a Cooper's Hawk and a red-tailed hawk in the area. So somebody may have gotten a meal. This is Mary Anderson, and I never paid attention to pigeons before re reading this book. And actually, I probably thought they were a bit of a nuisance. But after having read the book, I can't wait to see pigeons, mm -hmm. you know, especially, you know, if I go to New York City, you know, if I go to big cities, I'll definitely look for them and Think about them much differently. Mm -hmm. So this is Marty Burroughs. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, I was just going to say, I, I like several other people have said, I would certainly uh, pay more attention to them. I've always looked at them and put them on my eBird list. But I actually, uh, as a kid, had two pet pigeons, so I definitely fed them. They were, they pretty much were free for the most part, but they would come and they they come down and on our porch and sit next to me and let me feed them and I could pet them a little bit. And I had the names for them. So I had a little personal connection with my pigeon friends when mm -hmm. I was a kid. Did you have names for them? I did. I, I still remember Buffy and Buffy and Whitey, I think was the other one, White Tails or something. She had some white on her. I thought it was a pair, but they never had any children, so I'm not so sure now. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, I have to confess that uh, I did not pay attention to pigeons. Um, a little bit like I don't pay attention to squirrels that much. Um, and But my attitude has been adjusted um, so I have to thank Rosemary for that. Well, one thing that has really uh, convinced me that they are so beautiful is that iridescent neck sheen, the pink and the purple. It is just uh, really something. So that really uh, boosted my enthusiasm. Well, if you've read the book, you know that uh, Rosemary mentions the pigeon movie database and how important pigeons have been to, to movies in the past. Um, I found that very interesting. Um, one of the movies listed here, Eat, Pray, Love, later in the book, you may recall that uh, Rosemary, with her usual humor, makes a pun on that. And she's talking about predators and she refers to she calls this uh, incident eat, pray, P-R-E-Y, with a colon, dove. Eat, pray, dove. Well, also, Rosemary talks about, really, she said birds are dinosaurs. And it's our link. It is our link to the past. And here we are, really, we are currently in Jurassic Park as the birds are descended from 
theropods and which include Tyrannosaurus rex. So um, birds emerged a long time ago, 150 million years ago. And it's not real clear when pigeons emerged, but they're estimating about 60 million years ago, which is a six million years after the asteroid hit the earth and all the dinosaurs were destroyed. So she has several parts to the book, part seven parts plus that extra credit. And in um, part one, she talks about basic pigeonology. And uh, she says pigeons equal doves. They're the same things. And it's from uh, the large bird family Columbidae. It's worldwide, except for Antarctica. And uh, the uh, scientific name for this bird that we're talking about is Columba livia or feral, for the feral pigeon. We also know it as a rock dove in our field guides. And uh, coming from the French word for pigeon, pipera, and then also uh, the Norse or Germanic word related to dove, which may mean dive or dip. So I wanted to include some of the other uh, pigeons that are related uh, to, that are in the family Columbidae, but are not in the same genus uh, species. So Rosemary's favorite pigeon is the Nicobar pigeon from Southeast Asia. And then there's the Kiriru from New Zealand, uh, the Dodo, which uh, is extinct, but um, looking at it, its face looks lo a lot like a, a baby pigeon's, the infant pigeon's face. And then there's the Victoria crown chicken, uh, excuse me, oh my gosh, pigeon, Victoria crown pigeon. And uh, that is from Southeast Asia or New Guinea. And then there's also the orange dove, from Fiji and aren't they beautiful? Well then um, part two, the next section uh, goes into um, talking about pigeons and poop. And she does talk about poop quite a bit. And um, she also then, this is her chapter linking the evolution of pigeons and people together and how they have affected each other. So, um, for a long time, pigeons have served as a huge source of food, include, and we call that squab. They're up to about four weeks of age for a, a pigeon. And then of course the poop is fertilizer, also used to soften leather. And then it's uh, potassium nitrate serves as saltpeter for gunpowder. That's to me, unfortunately, that that was discovered, but um, they are, they were domesticated over years and years and thousands of years and they reproduce easily. They hang around people and then they come home. They're great for messaging it's, as she refers to the first pigeon internet. Um, they're used for show, for racing. Unfortunately, they're for target practice. Um, they've been companions to human beings and they've also been used for research. And especially Darwin used pigeons for research and um, made a lot of inferences about natural selection from his work on pigeons. And I learned through reading a little bit, there's a, 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 a Darwin pigeon website um, kind of honoring his history and his uh, his pigeons that he studied are in the Tring Museum, the Natural History Museum of um, England. And we talked about the Tring Museum in our Brook Club last year because that was the site of a great heist. Uh, fortunately, the person who did all the stealing wasn't interested in pigeons. So Darwin's, Darwin's uh, research materials were, were safe there. Uh, I looked up in my joy of cooking and there are, there are two or three recipes for squab. Um, 
I have not ever had squab. Has anybody else had squab? Has anybody had squab? We got some no's, huh? Well, also what uh, has been remarkable, I found this particularly interesting, was the way that human beings have assisted pigeons with their living quarters. And uh, this picture shows a site from a, an archeological site in Israel. Uh, they believe it's from, <clears throat> excuse me, from the Iron Age. Then we have some more modern uh, and beautiful. The architecture on these is so beautiful. Um, one from Dieppe, France. Another one that's very old from the 16th century, also from France. And then the other third picture is from Estonia uh, from 1869. Well, uh, part three is about anatomy. And I was wondering for any of you, did anything uh, strike your curiosity about this whole long chapter from beak to cloaca? I was wondering too, <clears throat> for people, um, and Nancy too, with you being um, involved with the Natural History Museum and your background, um, one thing I was interested, found to be very interesting was how birds breathe. And I was wondering if that's something that you were familiar with. Yes, um, yep, the cloacal kiss, as they call it. <laughs> where the, the birds put, put their cloaca together, which is the common opening that poop comes out of, the eggs where are laid, and then that's where they mate. Um, but yeah. Well, I found the breathing um, very fascinating. And so I looked at it a little bit uh, more closely. And uh, this is a picture showing uh, the many air sacs that birds have as part of their whole respiratory system. And uh, so there, there are several of them. Uh, Rosemary has a beautiful picture in her book too. Um, I think page 76, um, but it's, it's a very graphic picture. Um, and I like it that it's in color. And so you can see all the different wing sacs, excuse me, air sacs. And then I found uh, this uh, picture that uh, simplifies it a little bit, showing how fresh air or blue air oxygenated, oxygenated air comes in through the trachea, the bronchus, and then it goes into the posterior, the air sacs. And then with the next breath, you know, the air will come through and it'll get pushed into the lungs. And this is where gas exchange, oxygen and carbon dioxide actually exchange. But then also with that exhalation, that air in the lung goes into the other air sacs. And now we start all over again with an inhalation and an exhalation, and then that air that's in the anterior air sacs that has probably carbon dioxide in it, it gets back into the trachea and goes out. So, um, and this really emphasizes like uh, this respiratory system has access to oxygen rich um, air all of the time, whereas the way we breathe, we always have this kind of dead space. Um, nothing happens from, from our mouth down to our, our lungs, really. There's no gas exchange whatsoever. So this has worked out very well for birds. And I appreciate that uh, uh, Rosemary brought this all up in her book and made it kind of understandable. 
I don't remember learning this in biology. Um, also, um, I put a website up here. There are several on YouTube if you if you're interested and you want to see some other ways of uh, looking at this material. Part four, she gets into into domestic pigeon breeds, the fanciest flocks. And I thought we'd take a look at a few of these. Um, there's the Archangel. And uh, that seems to be, they're thinking it may be from um, Russia. And it's really those pink iridescent uh, that sheen is so highly evolved here. And then it contrasts so much with the beautiful dark feathers of the body. And then we have a fantail. And um, there are three times as many feathers in that tail than in a regular pigeon. And it kind of looks like a turkey. You know, what we think of as our Thanksgiving turkey. Um, it does have difficulty flying. And then there's uh, the Jacobin. And look at that magnificent <laughs> coat it has. That's uh, apparently Queen Victoria found this to be, uh, this was one of her favorite pigeons. Now it does present problems because the pigeon can't always see her children to be able to help them or his children. And also it makes it hard to eat. So uh, there you go. She also brings up the point earlier in the book. Uh, she said uh, birds equal puppies and bringing out the idea that uh, humans have domesticated uh, dogs over thousands and thousands of years and pigeons too. And of course, there's so many breeds of dogs. And then um, she gets into part five, it's plumages and patterns. And this was very helpful, I think, to get a little bit of a sense of uh, the grasp of genetics. And basically there's the red ash, the blue and the brown colors of pigeons. And red ash is dominant over blue and blue is dominant over brown uh, genetically. And then also there are the patterns. Um, T check is dominant over check, which is dominant over bar, which is dominant over barless. And the T check on this picture, you can't see it real well, the little T's, uh, white tips on the feathers, but in T checks, the basic uh, plume the, of the wing is quite dark. You can see more in the check. It stands out more because that uh, wings are not so dark. The bar, um, the bar feature seems to be what the what Rosemary says is like getting closest to the wild pigeons, like kind of maybe the original. And then there's the barless without any without any bars at all. So this graphic kind of gives you a, a kind of a sense of the possibilities of, of genes. Uh, and uh, I found it kind of helpful too. Um, you can see there's the ash red color, the blue and the brown, and then also the patterns. And on this graphic, really the T-check uh, it's not, I can't really see that there is a T check at all on those dark wings. And then you can also see there's another feature called spread, uh, which refers to having a lot of all one color to a bird and then dilute where there's uh, less color. There are variations in the intensity of the color. There's also a, a recessive red trait and also a recessive white trait that it isn't listed on this picture. 
But how many possibilities are there? Wow. In part six, this is the longest chapter and there's so much behavior that she goes over. And um, I thought I'd go through a few of those. Um, it's, there's an awful lot in that chapter. Um, and talking about how birds peak and the noise speak and the noises that they make, um, I thought it was interesting too how she uh, explained the wing clap uh, that I think a lot of us may hear when we hear morning doves um, take off as, long, as well as the wing whistle. But she uh, describes that wing flap as that the birds bring their wings up and like they hit the back of their palms together. And uh, it serves, can serve as a warning. It's one of its, seems to be its meanings. And then um, on the body function, she spends a little bit of time talking about just how uh, pigeons drink. And they seem to have a different mechanism than other birds, as though they have a straw and they're able to use negative pressure to, to bring, um, to drink. Um, getting around, I think a lot of us are familiar with pigeons as, you know, they are on the ground and we see them walking and, and running and their head bobbing. Um, and also she makes a point of talking about how they take flight. They can do that just like a vertical lift, which is uh, phenomenal that they're able to do that. And also uh, she talks about how they, they do get onto the subways, take a ride. <laughs> um, some other behaviors. Uh, staying pretty with their preening and, and really taking a good thorough bath. She is so funny. She made a little, uh, she had quite a bit of humor in her section about uh, staying pretty and saying, I'm, I'm preening in the rain. Um, her humor is just throughout the whole book. And then she talks a little, uh, about social and romantic life and the courtship and uh, several steps to the courtship. She brings up a couple of times of how males show off after sex with jumping up in the air and, and clapping, clapping their wings. Um, so lots of courtship behavior, which they continue to do after they've had their, their uh, family. Uh, Talking a little bit about nests, um, she, she talked how nests are really ne not necessarily very neat and elaborate or architecturally sound, but can be just a pile of twigs. And then on a ledge is a, a place that pigeons really like to, to nest. It was also a little bit gross uh, talking about how uh, pigeons really, they will poop in the nests. The, Babies will poop in the nest. There may be um, eggshells in the nest or maybe even a dead chick. And they don't really clean up and they may use the, ne the nest again. Um, the laying of eggs was uh, kind of interesting too that they're eight to 12 days after mating, um, two eggs will be laid about 40 hours apart. Mom and dad both take time to sit on, uh, the, on the nest and um, mom does the most time, mid-afternoon to mid-morning, and then dad is on duty from um, until mid-afternoon, um, and he is not supposed to sleep. He is supposed to be awake and keeping um, the eggs safe from predators and keeping them warm. They do take it quite seriously, and they keep their eggs covered about 99% of the time. So in part seven, she talks about uh, some troubleshooting, some problems that could happen with, uh, for pigeons and how we might be able to help. She talks a little bit too about uh, the idea that seemed to come up previously in previous uh, years that people could get sick from pigeons. And so she uh, looks at the evidence that there's some risk, but it's pretty low. Um, it can occur if, 
someone inhales aerosolized bird excretions, um, handling sick or dead birds, and, and perhaps feeding pigeons. And there are rare cases of some other diseases. Um, but if someone's immunocompromised, they really should be careful, as they would around lots of other things, not just pigeons. In part eight, she goes into her chapter is uh, extra credit, and I appreciated that she went into some other things. She talked about uh, different birds, the predators, the falcons, uh, occipiters, and buteos that could find pigeons to be just their, their uh, Sunday dinner. And uh, she also talks about some other pigeons, and including this pigeon, this is the Afrin African speckled pigeon, and it seems to be the source of tea checks and checks um, being introduced into other populations. So, and it is such a beautiful bird to itself. And she also talks about other bird features uh, that we see in other birds, their coloring, sexual dimorphism, the difference between males and females, which doesn't really show on pigeons. And then also she talked about, uh, you know, adoption and also how to take care of if you find an injured pigeon um, and so forth. And uh, I went to one of the um, websites that she talked about, uh, a San Francisco pigeon rescue um, agency called Palomancy and found also um, another uh, agency for that provides all these clothing for pigeons. And um, so these are the original featherwear flight suit uh, is kind of um, a way to have a diaper um, on a pigeon and you can you put in disposable liners. And then just ready for Valentine's Day and St. Patrick's Day right now, you can find uh, a variety of items for your for your pet pigeon, uh, they're not inexpensive either, really, uh, $34 for a t-shirt. Uh, and then also there is uh, more in our region, there is the Great Lakes Pigeon Rescue um, dot org uh, website. And they have, when I looked at it a few days ago, they had like, 86 different pigeons that you someone could adopt. And here are a few of them. So Rosemary uh, Moscow resources, um, there are excellent two very good um, YouTube videos from Science Friday. And um, one is an interview with her. And then there's another short one, the Seriously Silly Science Cartoons of Rosemary Mosco. And uh, that's about seven minutes long. And it's delightful. And there's a, a picture here showing her with uh, one of her birds on her, on her head. It was a lot of fun watching that. Also, our, our good friend David Lindo has uh, an interview with her. And uh, that is an excellent interview. He is he he became a pigeon enthusiast uh, more so after reading her book and talking with her. So here's one of her kind of cute cartoons. It's just one of the first parts uh, of, of four, but I think it stands by itself. Just how you can uh, say something quite informative with a cartoon. So on the cover of the book, there's a quote uh, from David Sibley. This book will change what you think about pigeons. And it did for me. And for some of you, I know it has too. Well, please join us um, for our next book club, April 18th, when we're going to be discussing A World on the Wing by Scott Widensall. And uh, recently we found out, thanks to Nancy, she passed along information that Scott Widensall is gonna be at the Carlisle Center of Lorraine Metro Parks, uh, uh, March 25th, I think at three o'clock. 
and uh, he'll be there for a live presentation. So anybody have any questions or comments? Um, did I hear you correctly that you said that the pigeons lived at the time of uh, the dinosaurs? And if that's true, why did the pigeons survive and the dinosaurs didn't? Well, actually, the pigeons evolved later, oh. after, yes, afterwards, after the dinosaurs became extinct. Okay, okay. And um, another thing that was impressive is in the uh, difference in each country, so many different countries that the, the colors were so different. Um, and then my th third question is, do you have a picture of a vertical lift? I'm trying to visualize that. Oh, uh-huh. Um, I, I, I don't have a picture offhand, but um, I don't know. Can anyone else describe what it's like when they see a morning dove or a pigeon, um, you know, yeah. take off? Yeah, I've never seen that. That's all. Oh, uh-huh. Mm -hmm. It just, okay. it, it simply means that they can take off st straight, straight up. Wow. So if you're ever downtown, you know, and something spooks a group of pigeons, they'll just, you know, go, jump straight up and, and take off. Oh. oh, wow. Okay. I'll watch for that. Thank you. I've got a couple of pigeon observations, if you don't mind, Drina. This is oh, Nancy no. Powell. Um, Please go ahead. I was reviewing some literature ages ago. It was an ornithology literature. And, um, you know, as you mentioned, uh, and the book mentioned that pigeons are not the best nest makers, usually just a few twigs or straw. Well, um, in a very urban area, apparently it was an industrial area, um, people had found pigeon nests made completely out of small pieces of wire because the wire kind of looked like little twigs and the pigeons picked it up and they made their nests out of wire. Wow. Wow. I, I thought that was kind of interesting, you know, how they could use materials right from wherever they're living. Again, grasses, twigs, wire. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to ask the, the group here, how many of you have ever when a pigeon, say, comes down from under a bridge and starts flying, how many of you have ever kind of followed that pigeon with your car and looked at your speedometer and just tried to figure out how mm -hmm. fast that pigeon was flying um, with, you know, just taking a couple of wing beats and, and they're just zooming along and you're like, wow, that is amazing. Anybody ever do that? Follow a pigeon along? No. Okay. Well, I have, and of course, I'm very, <laughs> I'm very careful when I'm. Usually, it's on a freeway, and you know, a pigeons flying ahead, and I, I, I kind of speed up with it, and you know, they'll, they'll be going, you know, 35, 40 miles an hour, and they're just flapping their wings, la, la, la. So they are very, very powerful flyers. Oh, huh. that's impressive. She, um, Rosemary talks in the book too about how pigeons were used for messaging and how um, they could fly 60 miles an hour and uh, fly for four hours to make a destination. And they were so helpful in uh, some very serious war situations. Yeah, I, I personally found the historical anecdotes like that to be the most interesting part of the book. The, some of the anatomy stuff was really interesting too, but um, like a French pigeon that got shot like six times and then delivered the message and saved thousands of lives. <laughs> and as recently as World War II, they were using pigeons. So interesting. I found it very interesting how uh, way back in the old days, they used the guano seemed to be so important for fertilizer. Yeah. I've heard of that about uh, bats and, and seabirds, but I didn't realize pigeons were in on, in on that. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. I thought it was interesting, the head bobbing, how the body was really catching up to the head. 
And uh, and also when yes. they were discussing when she was discussing the domestic pigeon breeds, I would um, Google the different breeds, and it's worthwhile watching the flight of the Birmingham Roller. It just the 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 bird the pigeon rolls backwards, kind of, and, and it just is very strange. And I was wondering why they would breed yeah. the pigeon to do that. We'll do weird stuff with breeding. <laughs> yeah, they really do. <laughs> well, breeding, breeding of a lot of different creatures, you know, there's some, there's something about the way humans do breed for what reasons. It doesn't always lead to uh, healthy things for the animal. Um, mm -hmm. But that tumbler, that roller, is it's remarkable. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you know, just, I, I, oh, I just want ahead. to point out. I just want to point out that Carla um, shared in the chat a video of slow motion of vertical takeoff. If anybody wants to to see it, or Drina, I don't know if you want to go over to the chat and see if you could play it for everybody. Okay, let's see. That might be. be uh, technically challenging for me. Let's see here, because I'm in another screen, I think. Um, well, while Drina's pulling that up, hopefully she can. Uh, again, this is Nancy Howell. Um, yeah, um, a, a lot of pigeons were bred during the Victorian ages. Oh, good. Oh, wait, let to see this. Oh my God! Oh, there's a morning, yeah, morning doves taking taking off vertically. <laughs> That's amazing. There you go. Thanks, Drina. That was great. Wow. Oh, thanks, Thank Carla. Carla. Yeah. Maybe you don't. You want to unshare your screen so we can see everybody again. Okay. Now. Okay. Let's see here. I don't know if you can do that. Anyhow, um, during the Victorian times, um, yeah, pigeon breeding was super important. So having tumbler pigeons, having roller pigeons, and I even was—I I didn't own them, but somebody else owned uh, a breed of pigeon called a parlor tumbler, mm. and they couldn't fly at all when they oh. tried to fly they would just roll around on the floor. Oh um, and uh, could you imagine, and during the Victorian times, everybody's sitting around drinking their tea and you have brought in your, your parlor tumblers and they're white ones and black ones and barred ones and, yeah, and red ones and just rolling around on the floor. <laughs> Very strange. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else? This has been terrific, Drina. Thank you so much. I, I, I enjoy watching pigeons. I hope it get, has started people to think a little bit about uh, a misunderstood bird. Definitely. Yeah. I, I'm so glad so many people read the book too and enjoyed it and um, were introduced if it's your first time to read one of Rosemary's books. Thank you. I guess too, Nancy, have you said anything about our uh, the next monthly meeting? No, I haven't, but uh, our next meeting uh, will be on the first Tuesday of February. And the date, of course, I don't have it right at my fingertips, um, is on, of course, find it, uh, February 7th, Tuesday, February 7th. And we are having a speaker from the um, uh, National Loon Center, uh, which is in Minnesota. And um, Natasha Bartolotta is going to be speaking about loons and lake stewardship. So mm -hmm. how important lakes uh, up in the uh, Canada and the northern tier of states, um, how important they are to the not only the common loon, but some of the other species of loon. Uh, that that uh, inhabit the uh, northern tier of North America. 
um, but that starts at 730. And uh, if you're a member, you will get a Zoom link. If you're not a member, you can uh, register through Eventbrite. So we hope that you can join us on Tuesday, February 7th. Okay, sounds good. All right. Drina, thank you again ever so much. Great, okay. great book. And we great hope book. everybody will everybody will join uh, the book discussion in April for Scott Widensall's A World on the Wing. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank Good night.